Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so you will not grow weary and lose heart. so grateful that you're tuned in this morning. Just want you to know that uh, we realize that sometimes it's really hard at home to sing along and it's just uh, it just doesn't feel the same without the congregation but um, just want to know that we, we do we really miss seeing your faces 
but we're confident that in these days that they're going to pass and that God is in control of it all because he has done great things and he never stops working because his name is great and he will be praised. So I just want to pray that you would join us this morning in praising. There's a lot of people with you that are singing, so I know you can't quite hear them or see them, but they're singing right with you. So let's just praise his name and let's lift it up. Worship 
Maker God, you are the only one that is worthy of shedding light in this world. You 
did it through your son. And we give you praise this morning for you are so good and you are so worthy. We give you all the praise. We give you our lives. We give you our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name. Welcome to Valley Brook Church. We want to be able to connect with you this morning. If you would, please take 30 seconds and fill out our connection form online or through our app. That would allow us to be in touch with you and walk with you on your spiritual journey. Our mission here is to know and share the life-changing love of God, and we would love to do that with you. Hey, Julie, is that you I hear down there? Yeah, Nate, I'm down here. I'm just doing a little dusting in my office. Good morning, friends. Uh, these are the days I really miss one of my office volunteers who made it a regular practice every week to do a little dusting on my desk. As we look forward to having your return in person, we are planning a cleaning event. Next Thursday, one week from today, from 6 to 8, we will join and do some cleaning. Uh, we'll tackle various tasks from cleaning stairways to doing some dusting to even maybe scrubbing under the seats in the auditorium. If you love cleaning or you hate cleaning, you just want to serve, Come and join us. Be prepared to wear a mask inside, but we will have some outdoor tasks as well. Hmm. Nate, are you cleaning in the 410 already? Yeah, I am, Julie. I'm just wiping the counter in the 410. You know, being in the 410 reminds me of all the amazing ministry teams that we have here. And in September, we're gonna have a need for our ministry teams to start again. Teams like the connection team, the greeting team, and the tech booth team. If you would like to join one of our amazing ministry teams, just go to valuebrookchurch.org slash teams, fill out your name, email, and let us know which team you would like to join. You can join our team starting in September. Hey, Julie, is that you I hear mixing sound in the auditorium? Hey, Nate. Yeah, I'm in here. I'm just getting ready to record the message. As I am preparing to record the message for our live stream this Sunday, I'm reminded of this verse from 1 Thessalonians. We give thanks to God for you, all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Valleybrook, we are so thankful for your faithful giving during this season. Here at Valleybrook, we, we celebrate a Give First God. Here are ways you can continue to give to Valleybrook. You can write a check and stick it in the mail. You can go online, either through our website or through the Valleybrook app. Click Give Online and follow the easy steps. Hey, Nate, it looks like you're almost ready to record. Yeah, I'm here, Julie but I'm not getting things ready for me to give the message. I'm getting things ready for Evan to give the message. But as I'm getting things ready, I'm looking up at our balcony and I'm noticing our kids area. And it reminds me that we have amazing kids videos on our website that you can watch with your little ones to help make disciples of them in your own home. Well, I think I have things ready. Evan, you can come on up. Well, thanks, Nate. And good morning, church. My name is Evan Petros. I serve here on staff at Valleybrook, and it's a great privilege to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, we're continuing our study through the book of Acts called On the Move, and this week we're landing in chapter 17. Chapter 17 is a continuation of Paul's missionary journey. We see from the beginning of chapter 17, Paul preaches in Thessalonica, but he's chased away by jealous Jews, and then he's sent to Berea, where the same thing happens again as he tries to preach the gospel. And that lands him in the city of Athens. And that is where our text starts today. So let's take a look and see what happens. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 16 and read through verse 23. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who had happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You're saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addresses them as follows. Men of Athens, 
I noticed that you were very religious in every way. For as I was wandering along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I am telling you about. Pray with me. God, thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you for your word. And Father, I just ask that you would open our hearts to receive your word. God, I would ask that you'd help me speak your word, that your words would be my words, that you'd rid me of any selfish ambition, and you would just take over in this moment. That at the end of today, we would know you better and want to share you with the people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So last year, Charity and I had the awesome privilege to travel around the world with Next Step Ministries. They're a missions organization based out of Madison, Wisconsin. We went to seven states and two countries visiting mission sites to help revamp a media presence and also share fresh vision for those who are looking to come and serve. It was a bit of a whirlwind because we did all this in eight months. And it was awesome because we got to see some amazing things, both culturally and spiritually. There was a common thread in each place that we visited, each mission site, each organization, each church. There was something that was similar with each of them. They had a seriousness for the gospel. And this seriousness perpetuated every aspect of their life, sparking them to engage with people, to share the gospel with them, to meet people where they were at, speaking life and dignity into people created in God's image, breaking down walls of sin and idolatry. This was, for Charity and I, in a sense, the same as Paul's missionary journey. You know, other than the fact that we were flying in planes and not at risk of shipwreck, we had the same goal, to go and to make Jesus known. That's Paul's journey. And a common thread that we see throughout all of Paul's missionary journey is the same that he traveled from city to city, from Thessalonica to Berea to Athens and beyond, two things remain the same, his seriousness for the gospel and his engagement with people. So let's take a look at Paul's experience in Athens, what he saw, what he felt, and what he said. As he walked the streets of this famous city, he saw what it was so proud of, idols, Idols around every corner, representing Greek uh, gods of mythology and culture, innumerable shrines dedicated to whatever man saw as fitting to be worshipped. This place was the epicenter of progressive thought and ideology. Roman satire exaggerates that it would be easier to find a god in Athens than it would to find a man. It was the home to the place of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. A pronounced Athenian historian named Xenophon said this of Athens, it is one great altar and one great sacrifice. Read with me verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. The Greek adjective here occurs nowhere else in the New Testament, and it hasn't been found in any other Greek literature. In most English translations, it's rendered full of idols. Here it reads that idols were everywhere in the city. But the idea idea seems to convey more of they were under idols or swamped by idols. It was literally a forest of idols. A city that that was under idolatry. And it was almost as if the city was meant for idols and not idols meant for the city. And it sounds about right, according to our friend Xenophon. The city was wholly given to idolatry. But it made me wonder, why did the Athenians have so many idols? What were they searching for? They were searching for, I believe, what we're all searching for in life. Purpose. They wanted to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And these idols were not powerless. Idols then and idols now have the power to manipulate our emotions, control our thoughts, and they demand our affections. The more the Athenians worshipped the idols, these things that they were either demonically inspired or, or natural occurrences like wind and waves, the more power the idols had over them. 
The thing is that these idols, they were never satisfied with worship. They needed people to keep giving them worship, to keep giving them meaning. And in giving them meaning, the Athenians, rather than gaining purpose like they were searching for, they would lose purpose. They would lose joy, and it became a vicious cycle that left emptiness in their hearts. And Paul knew this when he saw the idols all over the city, and it raised something in him. Here it reads that he was deeply troubled. In a more literal Greek translation, it reads that his spirit was provoked within him. And that might be what some of your Bibles read this morning. The Greek word translated to provoked is used in such a way that it's not describing a sudden burst of anger, but rather a continuous, settled reaction to what he saw. The same Greek word is found one other time in the New Testament in the book of Corinthians, where Paul writes that, Paul, that love is not easily angered. And this is helpful because it helps us realize that this anger that was provoked within Paul is motivated by love for the Athenians. He had love for God and love for people. And it was in that order that caused him to be angry at the sight of idols. And the same word is also used to describe how God felt when the Israelites of the Old Testament would build idols out of their ignorance and sin. Holy anger, whether it be from Paul or from God, was provoked at the sight of idols because, one, they steal and replace the glory which only belongs to Jesus with something much lesser. And two, they spiritually blind people, God's children, from seeing the true beauty within Jesus. I served in Haiti a few years ago, and while I was there, I learned some things about their idol worship, which is called voodoo. They would often give burnt offerings, you know, very, for various reasons, whether it be for weather, for, for, uh, for life, for having children. And during these burnt offering ceremonies, they would play specific drum beats. One type of drum beat was a slower, methodical beat. And this was usually for a ceremony of burnt offering of crops, where they'd be asking for a harvest from the gods. Uh, there was a second drum beat that was faster, and it had a specific rhythm, and this was used during the ritual where they would offer burnt offerings of live animals. The third drum beat, however, was one that brought great sadness to the Christians as the beat would tremble throughout the mountains. It was a very fast and a very erratic beat, with usually twice as many drums as the other rituals. And this beat, the people knew it, meant there was a live child sacrifice as a burnt offering. So when I was there one night, I laid awake. It was about two in the morning, and I started to hear the beat of drums, and I knew immediately what this beat was. And the more I thought about what was happening over the mountain from where I was, the more I was enraged and saddened, filled with grief. You see, when Paul walked around Athens, he didn't just take notice of the idols. He saw them, and he looked, and he looked, and he thought, and he thought, until the fires of holy indignation raised within him because he knew the power they had over the people. He saw men and women created in God's image for God's glory, giving to idols the homage that belonged only to God. It angered him. Paul's response and action to what he saw and felt was to go straight to the synagogue, to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. It also led him to speak publicly with people in the square, and he also debated with Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. The anger that was provoked by the idol worship and Paul's zeal for Christ was motivated by love, and it sparked him to engage with people. Some heard this message and were saved, and other people called him a babbler, which culturally literally meant he was a seed-pecking bird. In other words, they were calling him stupid. Paul took the gospel seriously, and in verse 22 through 34, Paul preaches the whole message of the gospel in its fullness. And this was to the high council of Athens, very notable men. He speaks of God as creator and Lord, one who does not need to be served, and he also speaks of the intrinsic value that we have as people being created in God's image. He speaks about 
God being the one in whom we find everything we need and our soul can be satisfied. It's really awesome because he also talks about God as creator bringing us from a common ancestor, Adam and Eve, which abolishes racism and discrimination based upon ethnic background, which was exceptionally profound because the Athenians considered themselves an Aryan race. They were smarter and better looking and more capable than the other people around them. He speaks of us as God's children and that if we seek him, we can find him because he's not far from any of us. He addresses God's judgment and the necessity of repentance for sin in order to be saved. And finally, he closes his speech by announcing God's authority over all things and the basis of this being true in that Christ was raised from the dead. For the entire foundation of Christianity hangs on the fact that Jesus raised from the dead. If he did not raise, our faith is meaningless and also foolish. But he did raise, and there's historical facts to prove it. Again, the high council, some laughed at him in contempt, and others were saved. Paul was serious about the gospel, so serious that idol worship angered him and sparked him to engage with people. You see, taking the gospel seriously sparks engagement with people. The world we live in now is ingrained with the same sort of philosophies as that of the Athenian culture. Stoicism is the philosophy of endurance, that you can learn to endure the world and improve yourself through certain cardinal values, wisdom, temperance, justice, and courage. While Epicureanism is the philosophy of pleasure, seeking happiness above all else, uh, that you can obtain your desires and you should enjoy the little things. Does this sound familiar to you? Those are the notions of almost every sitcom, TV, every Netflix original, every Hulu's exclusive that we should endure and enjoy. Pleasure is the God of our culture, as it seems. And the Athenians had a name for the God of pleasure. Its name was Hedon. Her name was Hedon, they called it. Not that those virtues, endurance, enjoying things, they're not bad in and of themselves. God created us to enjoy the world and to endure his hardships, its hardships with his pleasure. Because that's the fullest experience of life. But the primary goal of the Christian's life is to be fully satisfied and find our supreme pleasure in Christ, not in virtues of philosophy. Because if we take these virtues of philosophy and they become the basis of finding our purpose in life, it's idolatry. It leaves us empty, blinded to seeing the true beauty of Christ. In a way, I see idolatry not as just a sin among other sins, but more of the sin that's perpetuated throughout the ages and leads to other sins. John Calvin, a French theologian from the 1500s, says that the heart, the human heart, is an idol factory. As a car factory, Factory tirelessly pumps out parts in order to appease our need for transportation. So the human heart tirelessly pumps out idols to appease our sinful desires, our sinful aspirations. This makes sense when we see that the first two of the Ten Commandments are, you shall have no other gods before me, and that you shall make no idols out of anything in heaven or in the earth or in the sea, and you shall not bow down and worship them, because I am the Lord your God. But God commanded that we should not do these things. So naturally, what does our sinful nature do? It does them. It creates idols and it worships them. Because the sinful nature is against the things of the Spirit. You know, these, this idea of, of idols and idolatry, it can almost sound primitive. We might think of statues carved out of wood or stone, uh, with a fire and people dancing and chanting around them. But the reality is that we have many idols in our culture today. In fact, I set a timer for one minute at, uh, to give myself one minute to think about what might be some modern-day idols. I came up with 18 in one minute. Money, sex, sports, work, children, parents, spouse, success, travel, friends, pleasure, cars, houses, schools, relationships, politics, 
cell phones, and making people happy. I think that's 18. Just about anything you can think of has the potential to become an idol in our life. Sin and idolatry isn't necessarily loving bad things or doing bad things, though that can be a part of it, but more often than not, it's loving good things too much or misplacing our love into things that can't fulfill us. That's what leads to things like eating disorders, where a person loves food too much that they eat, and they eat because it gives them comfort or joy, and it leads to negative health effects. Or also, the person who is so obsessed and in love with being thin because of the pressures of beauty culture that they eat too little, and it has negative health effects. When we love sex too much, it leads to broken relationships, abuse, or addiction. In July, this past July, there was a a UW study, University of Wisconsin study, stating that two-thirds of all Wisconsin high school athletes are experiencing or will experience depression and anxiety at the prospect of canceling fall sports. This mourned my heart. And it mourned my heart, not because sports are canceled, but because it revealed a tragic shortcoming of our society. It showed that we have not done a good job teaching our kids where to place the treasures of their heart. It showed that we have taught our kids to love sports too much and love Jesus too little, or maybe not love him at all. A well-known reformer, Martin Luther, says that, Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. In other words, whatever you trust most, whatever you find, you're trying to find your purpose in, what your heart goes to when you're in trouble, that's your God. And if that thing is anything other than Jesus, it's idolatry. You know, and and the worst part is, is that Nothing other than Jesus can satisfy so that if we're trying to find ourselves in sports or money or in our spouses or in relationships or in our work or in our, in our school or whatever it might be, when those things let us down, our, those things that our hearts are so cling to, when they let us down, we'll no doubt find ourselves depressed and anxious. These things, though they're really good things, were never intended to satisfy our souls. I'm personally a big, fan, a big fan of sports, to be honest with you. And when I was in middle school and early high school, my whole future, as, as I had planned it, relied on basketball. That, that was the plan for my life. And as a matter of fact, when I moved to Wisconsin, this whole basis of my future, basketball, was taken away from me. God took it away from me in such a radical way that he revealed the inner workings of my heart. And I was depressed and anxious angry because what was left in life for me. It's because I loved basketball too much and I loved Jesus too little. But I thank God that he did an awesome work in my heart that year. You see, when we love something other than Christ too much, it blinds us from seeing the true beauty within him and keeps us from being satisfied by him. Every day there are new things that it's fighting for our affections, fighting for our attentions. And unfortunately, while we're still in the flesh, we're going to have to fight hard against those things. We're going to have to pray continually that the Holy Spirit would give us power to fight against these idols and these sins in our life. We do this by taking the gospel serious in all of its fullness. In Paul's speech to the Athenians in verse... 22 to the end of the chapter, he addresses the high council in a profound way that also challenges us today. We hear a comprehensive message of the gospel. He proclaimed God in his fullness as creator, sustainer, ruler, father, and judge. From creation to consummation, God is the author of history. He emphasized God's greatness as beginning and end and also the one who satisfies our lives in profound and practical ways. The way in which Paul's heart burned when he saw the idols of Athens should cause us to reflect. What is our response to the sin and idolatry we see in the world, or the sin and idolatry we see in our own lives? 
Are we enraged like Paul because Jesus so, is so real and the gospel is so serious? You know, idols aren't self-sustaining. It's true. They need our worship in order to survive. The more value we give them, the more time and thought and worship we give them, the stronger they are over our life. But in that same sense, uh, the greater pain we will feel when they don't satisfy us, when those idols fail us, we set ourselves up for great, great pain. And this is just a disclaimer. When, we, when, I, when I mentioned husbands and wives and relationships and sports and all these things as, as being potential idols, I'm not saying that you should love and love and love those things less. I'm saying that you should love Jesus more. It's okay to love those things, but we should love Jesus more. We love Jesus more by spending time with him, both in prayer and in his word. Jesus sets us free. He gives us new passions. He gives us new desires. When God is our primary satisfaction, it's actually kind of counterintuitive. We find more satisfaction in the other things. The passion that then is sparked within us when God is our, is our sole provider, the lover of our souls, this passion will then cause us to go out and engage with people. We want to share the same passion, the same love that we've received with others. We will no longer be comfortable or desensitized to the idolatry and sin we see in our life and in the world around us. We'll be, we will be provoked like Paul to go out and engage with people for the sake of the gospel. Because the gospel is serious. And so the question is, are you willing to engage with people, even if their response might be rejection? Are you willing to engage with people, even if they call you a seed-pecking bird? They call you stupid, if it means that a single person might be saved. Right now, do you take the gospel seriously? Because taking the gospel seriously sparks engagement with people. We should be torn. We should be saddened, angered by sin and idolatry. This should lead us to go out in love to proclaim his goodness to the world that's so in need. Again, when I was in high school, this is after God had reshaped my heart in my junior year, I finally started to take the gospel seriously. This seriousness caused me to see the world in a much different way. And in particular, it reshaped what the world had taught me about sex and romance. I knew the right Christian answer to the issues of sex, but my heart desired something else. I was deceived to believe I could find lasting joy in sexual experience, whether it be physical or virtual. God set me free uh, from, from this, and such, it was such a serious freedom that I just couldn't hold it back. And there was a day where we were sitting at the lunch table, and my friends, these guys who, who I loved and cared for, they started to pass around their phones and show each other the videos that they had been watching the night before, and they were speaking vulgarly about the women. And I was so saddened and so angry for two reasons. One, because they were deceived. They were deceived to think that that could bring them satisfaction. And it was such a mutilation of God's beautiful purpose and sex. And secondly, I was angry because, because it was a mutilation of what God had created. And it was blinding them to truly finding the joy that they could have if it was done within the bounds of how God created it. My seriousness for the gospel in that moment sparked me to engage with my friends at the lunch table. I shared how God had reshaped my heart, how he had given me a new perspective on, on the issue that we were talking about. I shared how indulging in this would, would never lead to anything good, only emptiness and broken relationships, and how two-thirds of all of that online is illegally trafficked. I shared how much better a relationship with Jesus was, and I challenged them to lay this down in order to have this greater joy. Now, most of the guys laughed at me at the table. A couple of them had very particular choice words to call me. But about two months later, one of those guys reached out to me, 
and thought that he might have been in a full-fledged addiction. This was a serious problem, and he needed some seriously good news. And I was so thankful that as a Christian, I had the best news to give him. And from what I know, to this day, he is set free in Jesus' name. This is a very serious thing. We need to take the gospel seriously. Listen to what John Stott says in the matter of seriousness of the gospel. He says, Many people are rejecting the gospel today, not because they perceive it to be false, but because they perceive it to be trivial. People are looking for an integrated worldview which makes sense of their whole experience. We learn from Paul that we cannot preach the gospel of Jesus without the doctrine of God, or the cross without creation, or salvation without judgment. Today's world needs a bigger gospel, the full gospel of Scripture. So this story in Acts chapter 17 challenges us to analyze our own hearts, to check if there are things in our lives that we place above God. Do we have idols in our lives that keep us from seeing the true beauty of Jesus and being satisfied in him? We have to name them to claim them, though. If there are idols in our lives, we need to acknowledge it in order that the Holy Spirit might come in and have lasting change that leads to lasting joy. Now, Paul also challenges us to have a high view of God that is parallel and in accordance with how we see him in Scripture. And he challenges us to have a seriousness for the gospel in such a way that we're led to gauge, to engage with people, even if their response might be rude or rejecting. The question I asked myself this week is, is the gospel so serious in my life that I'm willing to step out in faith and talk to that person in the grocery store? Or talk to my neighbor, and engage with them about Jesus. Indeed, the gospel is the most serious and the most glorious news we've ever received. And as a church, we need to engage with one another in such a way that we'll build each other up in the gospel and personally weed out the idols that have hold in our lives. We do this by spending time with Jesus. And this then sparks us to engage with people to engage with people, to want to see them, our neighbors, our friends, our family, be set free the same way we're set free. And this is a serious freedom because the gospel isn't trivial. We, we must do this with the seriousness of Paul. And I pray that, that we see the way that Paul saw, being zealous for God's glory, that we feel the way that he felt and that we speak the way that he spoke, presenting the gospel in its fullness to a world deeply in need. When we take the gospel seriously, it sparks us to engage with other people. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, how you come in and you change us, give us a new life, and you set us free with such a serious freedom and I pray we will share it with everybody that we possibly can, even if it means facing rejection or, 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 or false treatment. I ask that you'll give us the eyes and the heart of Paul and the words of Paul to share your good news with this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, we have some discussion questions that will help you grow in your faith. So I want to ask you to either pause this video once we're done and discuss them with whoever you're with, or take some time on your own to meditate with them. Do it today or be intentional about doing it this week. I also want to encourage you to fill out our online connection form. This is a place where you can get connected with things happening here at Valley Brook. You can ask questions or you can share prayer requests that get prayed over every Tuesday. We look forward to hearing from you. And in closing, I want to leave you with these words from Jesus. In John chapter 8, he says, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Know the truth of the gospel. Be set free. Take it seriously and share this freedom with other people. Have a great week, church. We'll see you again soon.